this over the next uh, um, 35 to 40 minutes is tell you about our research on quantum optical electromechanics. And um, also tell you about um, in the last part some um, work we're also doing on um, um, looking at another technology, and the technology is ship scale optical frequency calls. Now, um, I'd like to also upfront acknowledge a fine set of coworkers and collaborators, and evidently the funding agencies that actually have made possible of the, the research. So, um, so as an overarching motivation for the field of quantum optical and electromechanics, let me mention that mechanical oscillators are right, also heard in the past as works of really ubiquitous in science technology. Um, they are used um, in virtually every cell phone for F-bar filters. A, a modern GSM phone has about 100 of these filters. They're used uh, widely in accelerometers and also timing. And um, um, really the prime reason that um, they found their way into these applications um, is um, the two simple, two physical um, characteristics. The first is the speed of sound is vastly slower than the speed of light. Um, so about you know, four to five orders of magnitude. And that means that you can make um, resonance structures that are of much smaller dimension in the acoustic domain than in the microwave domain. So let's take an example, um, an F-bar filter and like a GSM telephone with 2.5 gigahertz uh, a resonant frequency. Um, you can have H-bar filters as small as 100 micron, even though the free space wavelength um, of 2.5 gigahertz is in the order of tens of centimeters. So it shows the dramatic reduction in the, in the size scale, which of course played a large role for integrated technologies like, uh, like filters. Um, um, now, um, maybe less evident, but also um, mechanical oscillator can have very high Qs. Um, there's limits to the utility of high Q for classical application like timing or, or, or at least our filters. Um, however, um, um, uh, the quality factor plays a very important role uh, when it comes to precision measurements um, and where the noise added by the mechanics plays a large role. And that's in particular true for gravitational wave detection. Um, and so gravitation wave detection does use mechanical oscillator. It's a very large one. In this case, the mechanics is in the form of pendulum modes of suspended mirrors. And uh, the limits of um, um, and the, and the limits that are associated with both the Brownian motion and also the quantum noise, those were the subject of very early studies already back in the 1970s. Um, we're really pioneering work of Braginsky and Kalili already thought about how to use test masses to detect, in this case, gravitational waves. And what seems like a an, an, an remarkably um, uh, remote uh, and unfeasible experiments uh, 50 years ago is not possible. Um, uh, gravitation wave detect waves have been observed. And what um, Braginsky and uh, Manukin uh, and Kalili were um, very concerned with in the, in the 70s was what are the ultimate limits um, of, um, uh, of, of precision sensing and how can you actually measure at all um, optical displacements. And one very um, um, useful and very widely used method to measure the motion of test mass is an interferometer. So in interferometer, you can find light inside an optical cavity. Um, so you have an optical field A, if it's classical, um, if you treat quantum mechanically, um, the number of photons is A dagger A. And then each photon upon reflection imports momentum. And that's actually called, this, this G here is a frequency pole parameter. It's nothing else than how much displacement you have uh, um, um, per, 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 um, per the unit, um, how many frequencies you have per unit displacement. And if you multiply that by n, then you just get the, the classical um, radiation pressure force. So h bar d times n is just a static force that the, the photons are in the mirror. And uh, this leads to a very fundamental principle. Um, and that is, uh, the very fact that you're measuring the motion also has a back action. And uh, this back action is not contained so much in the, in the it's contained it has two, kind of two origins. One is that back action can result in classical dynamics. Um, of which instability, uh, cooling, amplification are two examples, but also can, has a quantum component due to the fact that the radiation pressure actually fluctuates and there are quantum fluctuations. Um, and now if you take this classical force, you can also um, derive a Hamiltonian for this optomechanical interactions. And so what you do is you multiply the float on flux by 2 h bar k. So you have 2 h bar k momentum transfer, and then you recover n times h bar g. g is this frequency pole parameter. Uh, um, and uh, and uh, now if you multiply that force, and now if you write it quantum mechanically, your uh, force now becomes an operator, your number of photons becomes also an operator, and if you multiply this now by the position of the oscillator, then you have the Hamiltonian. Force times position is, is energy. Um, and this is the so-called radiation pressure Hamiltonian that you have heard before. And so the important uh, quantity that appears here is called G-naught, and that's uh, nothing else of how much the, um, the displacement of the mirror um, uh, moves the um, uh, um, moves the, uh, the, the the optical cavity frequency, and so um, so these optomechanical 
or the quantum limits resulting from this description were intensely studied um, in, the, in the 70s and 80s. And it's by now well understood that um, both classical dynamics of radiation pressure as well as quantum fluctuations do play, uh, start playing a role. Um, and there's, um, and um, so the quantum fluctuations give rise to well, well, very well understood limit of how accurately you can sense mechanical motion um, before you start perturbing it with the um, you know, quantum noise radiation pressure. Um, whereas the classical dynamics can give rise to what is called instabilities. Um, instabilities, in this case, are referred to a situation where the interaction of light and matter becomes more linear and where the motion of the mirror starts to oscillate. You have an oscillatory instability, very much like a, a, a phonon laser or a Bruin laser or a classical laser. Um, so a system or, or an optical parametric oscillator starts to generate uh, uh, photon-phonon pairs um, and gets exponential gain. Now, what is very interesting that uh, much of this um, very rich history of displacement measurement has been in literature for many, many decades, um, and, and uh, it had also been uh, found its way into um, uh, design of modern gravitational wave detect detectors, such as avoiding instabilities. But what happened about 15 years ago is um, that um, it was realized uh, first by work um, uh, at, when I was working with Caltech, Caltech here, Bahala, that you can actually explore these radiation pressure effects in, 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 in a much more dramatic scale in microresonators. And so I will show here um, just a slide, kind of historical slide, of, um, of to, but it illustrates, I think, nicely the principle of optical mechanics uh, one more time. And that is, if you have light confined to optical microresonators, this is an example of a, of a, of a whispering gallery resonator, tens of micron, um, then um, what you can dramatically boost is the interaction of light and mechanical motion. And, um, and this um, simple example illustrates the physics. So if you have light traveling inside these so-called whispering gallery resonators, um, you have a radiation pressure force uh, that, um, um, uh, and you have that force due to the fact that photons are confined by continuous total internal reflection, so they have a grazing incidence, and upon every reflection they transfer a portion of the momentum. So in one round trip, the total, um, uh, the direction of photon has changed by uh, 360 degrees, so you have a full uh, 4 h bar k momentum transfer, okay, so uh, h bar k, um, so 2 h bar k uh, momentum transfers. So if you have actually a 4 h bar k momentum transfer per, per round trip. So you, the, the photon you know, changed its direction uh, twice. So, and this implies that these optical microresonators, they are in fact natural embodiments of optical mechanical coupling. Um, and today, this is very well known, there's many, many ways in which you can engineer the coupling of light and mechanic, mechanics, either by exploiting the mechanical flexural resonance structure itself or by engineering them. And that's really the field of, uh, of optical mechanics. Now, um, compared to these macroscale gravitational wave observatories, one of the key advantages here is that this vacuum coupling rate is, is dramatically enhanced. And I'll give you a very specific example um, uh, later on. Now, um, these optical microresonators, despite being very, very simple devices, um, uh, have a very rich physics, um, not just radiation pressure, but also, I'd like to mention this and uh, highlight at the very end, they also feature a so-called kernel linearity. If you have a material like glass, silicon nitride, silicon, these materials that typically um, they exhibit inversion symmetry, and so the, the uh, nonlinear interaction of the material itself, okay, due to the fact that you have, you have, you have, you're operating in a, in a solid state medium and you have electrons that you can polarize, that is given by the so-called kernel linearity. And um, this kernel linearity is a four photon linearity, so you know, colloquially speaking, it annihilates two photons, creates two new ones. And what I'll show at the end is that this is actually a very precious resource um, um, for both um, frequency symmetry and also for quantum limited amplification. Um, and it can be used to create a new class of chip scale frequency chromes that can be used in metrology um, and, uh, and, and enhance our ability um, uh, of, of, for instance, timekeeping. But in many other classical applications as well. And so I'll touch upon this at the very end. So, um, so my laboratory um, is studying um, still this type of physics. So I showed this total resonance as an example, but there's a variety of kind of devices we are fabricating and studying that exemplify this physics of both radiation pressure coupling and the kernel linearity, uh, so these parametric interactions. And, um, and so, um, and what I'd like to first spend time on is tell you about um, yeah, cavity optimal mechanics or quantum optimal mechanics, um, depending on which regime you operate, and tell you about um, how you can harness these, these interactions in both uh, um, 
uh, in a bright variety of devices, such as the ones shown here, near field couple devices, um, superconducting devices. Um, and uh, then in the second part, tell you about some other applications of these microresonators in terms of chip scale optical cones. Now, um, so the, 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 the overview of my talk, I'll be first describing two experiments that harness this interaction of light and mechanical motion, and then talk about um, um, another activity in my group, which is using these microresonators, not for the radiation pressure coupling, but exploring the intrinsic heteronormality for frequency metrology. Okay, so um, um, so um, cavity optomechanics is by now a, a very well established field, and it's um, um, and, and two key ingredients in optomechanics is the ability to read out, amplify, and cool mechanical motion. And um, so the Hamiltonian that I derived earlier of coupling light to mechanical motion gives rise to um, two interactions. Um, if you are in the so-called resolved sideband regime, um, that regime implies that the cavity decay rate is much smaller than the mechanical oscillator frequency. And in this case, what you can do is very similar to Ein's drive sideband transitions. Um, and so there's an upper sideband transition um, that gives rise to amplification. Um, generates photon phonon pairs. So quantum mechanically, this is a two-mode squeezer. It's a, it's a parametric down converter for photon and phonons at the same time. Whereas um, if you drive on the lower side bent, you can um, have a swap Hamiltonian where you annihilate a quantum mechanical oscillator, create one in the photon. And, um, and you can change and address these two Hamiltonians simply by moving the laser from the upper to the lower side bent. And this has given rise to um, um, a lot of fascinating experiments in the last, uh, last really 15 years. Some spectacular advances of ground state cooling, quantum current coupling, you can squeeze the light, you can even squeeze the mechanics. Um, uh, on the other hand, you can also use this uh, um, lower side band of cooling for quantum, you know, for coherent state transfer, transferring quantum from the optical domain to the mechanics and back for optimal mechanical entanglement uh, um, swapping and also for FIFA control and squeezing of mechanical motion. So there's a large list of experiments, okay, that um, uh, have been realized um, using this uh, these two um, this, this this control. Now um, another advance that optomechanics really has afforded, and I take here an image actually of the thesis of Vivishek Sudhir, is that optomechanics uh, maybe un unknowingly also really advanced our ability to measure mechanical motion. And so here's a graph showing, um, starting with 2002, um, uh, the, the precision that was attained in experiments that measure uh, nano or micro mechanical motion. And, um, and there was a lot of activities in the early 2000s using single electron transistors like triumph transducers, uh, squids, SETs, uh, atomic point contacts. And what's interesting to see that in a very, very steep um, uh, improvement, and now my, my chart is even outdated now that I should really put the chart here at 10 MI6, what you heard also yesterday from Albert. So we can measure um, many orders of magnitude below the standard quantum limit, which is referred to the, um, the ability to resolve with your displacement transducer the zero point motion of the, of the oscillator. And, uh, and this regime is very interesting because this is the so-called back action dominant regime where measured back action starts to dominate. Um, and this can be simply noted uh, by the fact that when the product of imprecision and back action um, uh, approaches H bar, okay, um, so the, the imprecision and back action are bounded by H bar, so if the imprecision is much below the zero point level, then in fact the back action force has to, has to, has to compensate in order to still satisfy Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And so what I'd like to describe now is an experiment which is shown in this dot where we ventured um, uh, and made an experiment that pro deeply probes actually this, this sub SQL behavior um, and uses it for um, for quantum feedback. And so um, the notion of uh, of the experiment I'd like to describe or one experiment in optomechanics that harnesses displacement sensitivity is a notion of uh, of measurement based feedback. And um, uh, much of the work early work in optomechanics has explored this Hamiltonian that I described where you use upper and lower side and driving to cool the mechanical oscillators to lower occupancy. But um, what you can also do is ask the question, can you, can you achieve measurement-based control? And so in measurement-based control, what you do is your feedback is not um, a radiation pressure force to generate inside the cavity, but rather it's externally imparted. So if you think about a mirror that's being interrogated by these two green laser beams, and now these measure the position of the oscillator with an apparatus, say an interferometer, and now you can exert a force, this can be a radiation pressure force or capacitive force, and uh, this force now acts in response to X dot. So if you have a measurement record and you delay it, you can create a viscous force. So that's the point that you have this, this X dot here. 
And this is a technique that's uh, very well known. Um, uh, it's in fact known really since, um, since the 60s and 70s, and it's called stochastic cooling. And in stochastic cooling, um, that's where it was first successfully applied, at least um, when it comes to precision experiments. There's other historical examples, but this is a particularly, I think, interesting one where um, the idea is to cool the oscillations of an elect the proton beam that undergoes sort of betatron oscillations, oscillations in its transverse extents. And if you want to create a very high brilliance beam, you need to confine well the, uh, the, the, the antiprotons or protons uh, inside, the, um, uh, inside, your, inside your accelerator. And so what is done is you take a capacitive plate to measure the elongation and deviation um, from, the ex from the wish trajectory. And you have a certain kicker okay, that then pushes uh, um, the, uh, the, the protons. And what's actually quite fascinating historically is there's been a lot of controversy about if this is going to really cool where the energy is going. But today it's very well understood that feedback cooling actually removes uh, um, the really entropy from the system. And so we would like to do the same experiment and use this um, and, and construct using optimal mechanical principles a very sensitive displacement transducer to um, venture in a regime of quantum feedback. And then so quantum feedback being defined that the, the measurement back action does play a role. And so, we, um, so one of the devices that we developed with EPFL in my group um, has been a very, very sensitive displacement sensor for mechanical motion. And this shows here a silicon nitride beam um, uh, that runs across in red that is coupled to a wristband gain mode resonator uh, made from glass. It's a device that actually has a very short photon lifetime. It's only gigahertz, um, gigahertz line width. So the photons decay very fast. You're in the so-called um, uh, Markovian limit. For the experts, you have an optical fiber that we use to couple light into whispering going and out. And now um, the, the key principle now of transduction um, that, that can be witnessed here is that of near field coupling. And so the idea is that um, if you have a mechanical oscillator that is uh, um, uh, coupled to the, the, um, to the uh, whispering gallery mode resonator, then um, you have a very strong field gradient. Okay. Um, when you place a mechanical oscillator here directly on top of the silica disks, and here we engineer it to just 50 nanometers. I will not say much about how we do that. We're just going to say is that we, we're using techniques that are very well established also in semiconductor processing for, for making interconnect so-called uh, um, uh, CMP processing with sacrificial layers. And, um, and so, um, and so um, this gap now, what it allows to do is generate a very large um, um, so-called um, G naught. So let's take a look. So, the, so if you um, so we take the zero-point motion, if you multiply it by the frequency pull parameter, you obtain a G naught of about um, 15 kilohertz. Now there are systems with larger G naught, but what one needs to recognize is that this is, this is actually a substantial fraction of the mechanical oscillator frequency, and uh, and uh, even more so if you compute what's called the C naught or the single photon coupling rate, that actually is approaching one. And what does that mean? That means that we can resolve the zero point motion of the oscillator actually with, if we have high detection efficiency, okay, with just one sixteenth of an intercavity photon. So you need on average one photon in the cavity. Um, so if you take into account our fine detection efficiency, we just need one intercavity photon on average to measure at a standard quantum limit. So these are kind of, kind of remarkably high kind of sensitivities that you can obtain. Um, and so we have a very, very sensitive um, kind of optical parameter for the motion of this very light nanomechanical oscillator. And so with this oscillator, we ventured into experiments uh, uh, doing quantum feedback. And, um, and so what you see here is uh, the typical, a typical experiment, which in this case uh, occurred at low temperature. So we send light into the optical system. We measure the motion of the mechanical oscillator with an interferometer uh, with a homodyne detector. You have um, uh, here the noise spectral density. So this is a, a four megahertz mechanical oscillator. Um, it has Lorentzian line with here of five hertz, um, frequency of four megahertz, and it has about twenty thousand quanta of thermal motion, even at low temperature, because due to its low, um, it, it's uh, it's low frequency. And the background we call it in precision, and in the best case, it's given by shot noise, which implies that you can lower that limit just by increasing the power. Now, um, and so. Now, um, I would like to already highlight that um, the motion of the oscillator is not just driven by the, the environment itself, but also will have actually back action uh, uh, in the contribution from, from zero point motion. Um, now, um, when we start, so an actual experiment, there's not just one mechanical bolt with many, and also shows some of the engineering challenges that you face in the system. So what you see here is there's an in-plane and out-of-plane mode. We engineer them to be actually non-degenerate by, uh, um, um, by changing the, making the width and height substantially different. And also what you can see here is that there's a whole forest of other modes. Okay, these are actually modes of the disk structure themselves. 
okay, um, that we need to engineer and kind of push to high frequency in order to have a measurement band up to 10 megahertz where we can faithfully measure just the mechanical oscillator. Now we can characterize how sensitive we are in our measurements. Um, and, um, and, um, and so if we do that and increase, for instance, the, the, the power in this, in this system here, um, then you see that our noise floor drops. We are ultimately limited for the, for the expert by thermorefractive noise. And that thermorefractive noise um, is a good ten to, effect of 10 to 100 larger actually than, than what we've observed. And, um, and so when we start decreasing the noise floor, we're increasing our central noise. And what we then see is that um, we both see you know, heating of the structure due to just photothermal heating, the sample getting warmer. But also we see a contribution that's shown here in the dotted line that comes from the radiation pressure kind of flowing noise. Um, and so as the imprecision kind of um, scales inversely with the number of photons in the cavity, and C0, the back action actually rises. And this is again a manifestation of this Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now what you can do, what you can do next is a very classical experiment. And that's an experiment of, of feedback cooling. So you have this measurement record of the mechanical oscillator's motion. So what you can do is you can take it, um, you delay it, so thereby you make it a viscous force, you pl place an amplitude modulator on a second laser, and now you exert a radiation pressure force. This is called feedback cooling, and it's, it's, a, it's a very well-established technique, especially in atomic force microscope, which you can dampen and widen and kind of oscillator line with. And so if you do that in the current experiment, okay, you can cool the oscillator all the way to the noise floor. At some point, your motion is imperceptible from the background. It's a regime called swashing. I will not detail further, but it is the limit of how far you can cool in the technique um, before you run into a classical effect called swashing that will heat the oscillator again. Now, um, if we uh, do a feedback cooling experiment with this device, then what you can see here is that we can cool to final occupancy. Uh, and I'll relay a lot of the calibration, uh, not for this talk here, but we can cool to about five quanta of, of mechanical motion. And, um, and so what is actually interesting about this, this five quanta, well, what is very interesting about this is, is not the number, but the very, very fact that this experiment is probing quantum feedback. And why is that? Because um, um, in this case, we have a sensor, our interferometer, that measures the plant, our mechanical oscillator. It has that um, um, we take that motion, we put it on controller, you know, that's our that's our delay, and then we have the actuator in the second laser that cools. But what is also evident in this system here is that actually the sensor, our interferometer, actually has a measurement back action. And so what we're doing in this feedback cooling here is we're not only removing the, the, the thermal noise in the environment, we're actually also removing the measurement back action. In fact, we have about 2,000 back action quanta from resulting from making a strong measurement. And so the final occupancy is substantially below, in this case, of more than three, almost three hours of magnitude, in fact, 1,000 below, actually, this, this quantum back action limit. Okay, and so, um, um, so, um, so how can you probe that there is truly quantum back action in the system? How do we see this and can we exploit it? Um, and so, um, first of all, um, you can measure and make this uh, back action perceptible. And uh, the way to do that is to use the exact same apparatus and to realize that the, the, the fact that you're making a strong measurement changes also the state of light. So whereas we're sending a coherent state into the cavity, um, the very fact that we actually have quantum back action, so driving the mechanical oscillator, means that we're coupling the amplitude quadrature to the phase quadrature. The amplitude quadrature of the light okay, drives, constitutes radiation pressure quantum fluctuations, drives the mechanical mirror, um, couples back to the phase, and generates what's, what's now well known as, as polynomial squeezing. And so if we um, then use our experiment um, and, uh, um, and, and look in reflection, what we do see is that we have squeezing in the experiment presence. So in fact, so here we leave out the, the feedback, we just look at the measurement output, and what we see is that indeed, actually we have a, a, a region of very modest, but still we have squeezing present. Um, and uh, now a very natural question is, can we can we use that? So, that, so this first of all shows that there is a measurement back action observable, and this measurement back action here manifests itself actually as squeeze light. And that's um, uh, uh, so this is the radiation pressure quantum noise that has generated this squeezing is also the one we are suppressing in the in the feedback cooling. Now, one comment for the experts: uh, the feedback cooling itself actually does destroy the squeezing. So, um, so it's only an open loop configuration where you can observe this um, quantum noise reduction. Now, the quantum noise reduction deserved a number of experiments, uh, um, also actually starting with uh, experiments here from, from Amir Safeni and then also later um, our group and also Albert's group. Um, I think the record right now, I think, is in Albert's group is more than 3 dB. And so the question um, to ask is, can you actually harness these, these, um, this, this squeezing for, for measurements? 
And I'd like to make two comments. So the first is um, there's been proposals already um, of how to use um, um, squeeze light to improve interferometric position measurements. Um, and uh, in generally, um, there's two ways to do this. One is one can use um, and can inject squeeze states of light, but another possibility is um, one uses the light generated in the measurement process itself. And this technique of using the light, the squeezing that is generated by the measurement process, that's called very, basically a variational force measurements. And that was proposed by Vichenna and Subalvo. And we demonstrated a proof of concept experiment together with a group from, from NIST. So we injected a test force in the mechanical oscillator right in the region where we have squeezing. And um, what we could show is that in this case, we do get a 10% relative enhancement and an absolute one improvement that is less actually uh, than, than 1%. And the absolute improvement um, of this variational measurement over a measurement that does not employ the, the squeeze light um, is given simply by the strength of radiation pressure quantum. So if this overwhelms even at room temperature significantly in thermal noise, you can obtain significant improvements in the force sensitivity even in ambient temperature. Now, um, so this experiment, again, this is a very, very modest amount of improvement, but it raises a very interesting question of how can you actually improve and make these, um, uh, make these, uh, these forces um, um, uh, allow to obtain larger, uh, larger improvements. So I think I'll take here a few minutes to just give an intermediate summary of this, of this, uh, of this uh, presentation so far. So I've shown you this, um, that these optical micro resonators, um, when you engineer them in such a way to make combine it with mechanics, uh, give rise to uh, um, systems that you can use to probe, um, uh, measure, to probe quantum of measurements. Even a macroscopic object is, is disturbed. We show that we can achieve an imprecision for it to be below the SQL. And we have also achieved some of the closest approach to Heisenberg and Sendling, but of course, um, I think now this is even, even, even lower at the level of H bar. Um, you can also use this measurement precision to um, do what we call feedback cooling. And this feedback cooling is truly a quantum feedback because you you're actually canceling a significant portion of the quantum back action. In our case, is more than 20 dB larger than final occupancy. And we also show that the very fact that you can measure uh, um, with an optical light field very strongly allows you to generate quantum mode of no no noise. So quantum back action actually is a, a very precious resource and can be used for quantum enhanced force metrology. Now, nevertheless, the amount of uh, improvements right now that we have observed are very modest. They're only 400,000 Q, so that these, are, these are very low. And so this invites the question of how you can improve mechanical quality factors. And here there has been, um, uh, um, sub there has been remarkable impro improvements over the last, uh, last decade. And, um, and we heard already um, some of this in, in, in earlier talks. So you can, so the question for us has been how can we improve the quality factor of our near field mechanical oscillators. And what um, has happened over the, over the last decade is that there has been a substantial improvement, okay, in the ability, okay, to, um, to, uh, to engineer loss. And, and we are now in a, in a, in a regime where the, the mechanical quality factors are completely uh, um, orthogonal to a typical trend of volume and quality factor. And the technique that, um, one of the techniques that we have used in our lab to improve the coherence of uh, nanomechanical oscillators, particularly nano beams, has been to employ a concept, uh, two new concepts, one is of soft clamping and one of strain engineering. And I'd like to briefly detail of how we can make structures where the quality factor is not 400,000 as in the described experiments, but now reaches values actually of a billion at room temperature at megahertz frequencies. And the key concept here is that we don't use simple kind of strings, but we use strings, okay, with phenonic band gaps. And we can engineer with this phenonic band gap the mode envelope and can find the acoustic energy. And, um, and we use a technique that you've heard also, yes, they are soft clamping that improves the quality factor okay, inside the band gap by, by about a factor of 10. So this allows us to take an oscillator with a Q of 10 million and boost its quality factor to about 100 million. Now, one interesting uh, question is, what is this quality, what are these quality factors limited by? And generally they're limited by very simple consideration. It's the length of the oscillator, um, it's, the, uh, it's the height, and then there's the ratio of stress over strain. And this is simply given ratio of Young's modulus over stress that's given by the strain in the material. So how much strain you can import on, 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 uh, on, on, on the oscillator. So on these devices here, the strain is, um, um, is 1.3%. 
uh, correspond to about one gigapascal of, of, st of stress that you apply. Now, what you can do is um, use a technique from strain engineering um, um, that has been used in, in, uh, in semiconductor industry. You can, can actually take the mechanical oscillator and confine it and, and increase the local strain by geometrically shaping your string. And if you combine this with also the phenomenic aspect of phenomenic bank of engineering, you can obtain um, uh, stresses that are significantly higher, okay, that what you can naturally uh, obtain in, in, in mechanical oscillator. So here we increase this strain to about four gigapascal, close to yield strength. And this allows to make mechanical oscillators that have quality factors of 800 million even at room temperature. And this implies now that we are, um, so if you go back to the earlier results I showed, this would imply that here, the quantum back action for, for necrolyn coupling strength would easily dominate even, even at room temperature. Um, and so it shows that there's really a new ability to engineer mechanical dissipation in, 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 in new fashions um, that gives us rise to remarkably high, um, highly coherent systems. Um, um, and just as, an, as, a, as a teaser, um, you may also wonder how can you improve it maybe even further. Um, um, you know, generally low temperatures help dissipation, but not in the case of amorphous materials because they have so-called two-level systems. And, uh, and so this is an example of very recent work where we've also extended um, this idea of strain engineering to crystalline resonators made from strain silicon insulators. So the same SOI that's used for high mobility transistors can be used to create silicon devices. Um, and one of the uh, advantages of silicon is it's crystalline. It has an absence of so-called two-level systems of amorphous defect states and is expected to have much larger quality factor at low temperatures. Now, um, so this kind of really herald a new kind of generation of, I think, of, of optomechanical devices. And, um, and ge generally, um, um, optomechanical systems, um, um, even though now I've mostly emphasized kind of very basic experiments of quantum measurements, are also considered um, in applications, be it for quantum noise thermometry, so making thermometers that can calibrate temperature um, uh, without, um, uh, without uh, requiring calibration. They are being um, uh, considered for quantum links, uh, quantum hand force sensing, radio detection accelerometers. And um, what I'd like to do is, 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 is um, tell you about um, uh, two more experiments where we show how um, ground state cooled or cooled mechanical oscillators um, can actually be, be useful in an in engineering setting. And these are kind of still very early experiments, proof of concept, but they show kind of new device architectures, hybrid devices we can create. An example I want to give is that of a, of a microwave amplifier and also a non-reciprocal device that uses mechanics. And so here um, uh, um, is kind of the, the, the scheme of our, of our experiment. So we can not only generate radiation pressure phenomena in a... Um, We can not only generate radiation pressure phenomena in um, oh man, we can not only generate radiation pressure in in, in electrum in optical device, but also generate in electrical devices. And this is an example of, of how this uh, how this works. Um, and so here um, you have a vacuum gap capacitor that's your mechanically compliant element. And with this device, one of the experiments you can do is uh, generate non-reciprocity. And and how does it work? Um, um, what we are doing actually, we have uh, two microwave modes a high Q mode and a low Q mode that we can engineer. And by coupling actually the, um, and, and, and what we can now do is we can cool using this uh, um, low Q mechanical mode or mechanical oscillator and make it actually very dissipative. And this dissipation um, gives rise to novel functionality. In fact, it will, um, as described, actually allow to amplify um, microwaves in a way where the mechanical oscillator's occupancy appears as a noise figure. And, um, and so, um, so in the experiment, what we are doing is uh, what we're doing is we are pumping. We have so the experiment actually is a very simple experiment, where first we have uh, we have two tones here. So we have a tone where we sideband cool the mechanical oscillator, and then we have a tone which we interrogate on a high Q cavity. And uh, what we see is that um, the fact that we have cooled the oscillator actually to a very low temperature actually strikingly changes the response. Of the optical system. So whereas normally you just have a Lorentzian in the, in the microwave resonance, when you have this coupling to the cold mechanical dissipative reservoir, when you start pumping in the upper side, then the microwave line actually starts to narrow. 
and uh, even change the positive value. And this positive value is indicative of gain. So in fact, what's happening is here is the microwave field derives gain from this ground state quote mechanical oscillator. And in fact, what you can show is that you can make that way an amplifier, uh, not just an amplifier, you can also show that if you, um, um, sub, sub, um, sub, uh, if you increase sufficiently high the level of power, drive power, you can make a maser. So here you can see the sub-threshold re regime of the pump or pump threshold in the middle here of the threshold, and we start to see kind of amazing, uh, maser action above. So this is an example of a microwave amplifier that uses the dissipative reservoir actually as the, as the gain medium. And, um, and how well does the amplifier work? So how much added noise do we have from the amplification process? We can also characterize this. And in fact, we can show that this amplifier operates um, with typically two photons per second per hertz of noise. Um, it's actually, and the, the noise figure here um, just corresponds to about 0.6 quanta of mechanical noise. And so the beauty in this experiment here is that the ground state cooled mechanical oscillator, okay, is only perceptible to an outside observer as the gain figure of the amplifier. Okay, of this dissipative mechanical reservoir. So again, I'm, I'm being here quite fast, but it shows you just an example of how you can use mechanics in a, as, a, as a useful resource, okay, also to amplify weak quantum signals. Um, in a similar notion, one of the beauties of studying optomechanics in devices that are engineered, okay, contain multiple opt um, um, is, is shown here, is you can easily generate much more complex devices with multiple microwave modes, multiple mechanical modes. And how is this done? So here, for instance, we have two microwave modes. These are just you know, two different uh, configurations of the this, of this circuits, two different eigen modes. They're both coupled to a mechanical oscillator. But a mechanical oscillator, in this case, has two mechanical modes. Okay? Um, and these, are, um, these modes are um, just two different drum modes that you, that you have present. What, you, what can you do with, uh, with, with the system? What you can do next is you can use that system um, to generate non-reciprocity um, by exploiting ideas of by by simply applying four different drive tones okay to the microwave cavity and changing their relative phase and so I'll be very fast here but there's there's there's, there's techniques here that you can exploit okay uh, from parting a synthetic uh, synthetic uh, phase the, the the key why you break reciprocity here is is not in time modulation but just the fact that uh, frequency conversion itself is inherently non-reciprocal. Um, um, and you look at two different frequencies, and by choosing the appropriate phases, you can make a non-reciprocal uh, device. It only converts microwaves, frequency converts microwaves from A1 to A2, but not A2 to A3. And this actually we demonstrated, um, and, uh, and uh, we have here a device which in the forward direction, you see here the forward direction, the backward direction, and you see that in this case, uh, and the forward, uh, shown in blue and uh, red and, 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 and blue, kind of um, is in one direction, it's transmitted, in one direction is absorptive, Whereas in the other direction, when you change the phase, it's, it's opposite. And here, um, um, again, we use a notion of, so where is the mechanical oscillator in this, this example? The mechanical oscillator actually is, okay, the element that dissipates the energy. So the dissipative reservoir is precisely where the energy actually is, is absorbed by. And so this shows, again, this is another example of where you can use optimal mechanics for, 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 yeah, for, for novel non reciprocal effects. So in summary, I've, I've shown you um, um, how optomechanics can be used to, um, to probe the quantum limits of intermetric position measurements, um, to probe tabletop schemes to increase high sensitivity, but also to have to probe new kind of ways in which these mechanical oscillators can provide novel functionality, both in the classical sense, but also um, such as isolators, amplifiers, but whose quantum limits are, are, are evidently important. And um, I have, I'm, I'm running out of time, um, and so I'll be, 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 be here very brief. Only, um, I just want to mention that optical microresonators also offer uh, a test that to not only uh, study uh, um, uh, um, uh, optical, not only study uh, optic, optical mechanics, but also they give a way to study uh, new ways of generating optical frequency combs. And, um, and so frequency combs are, um, and I'll be, be very brief, I mentioned at the beginning, so frequency combs are really a, a novel technology, a, a very important for AML physics. It's, these are systems that generate, uh, and, and it will be very brief only. So in, uh, um, I'll only mention um, uh, in a nutshell that uh, optical combs are really a revolutionary tool invented by Ted Hench and Jen Hall, which earned a Nobel Prize in 2005. Um, and they are allowed to both synthesize optical frequencies or take optical frequencies and synthesize RF frequencies. 
and um, so they're, they're generated bidirectional, you know, coherent links, and they're typically generated by mode lock lasers. And what uh, our research um, uh, um, has led to uh, uh, now is a large research field of creating chip scale optical combs. And, and these chips are optical combs. What they're using um, uh, at the heart is nonlinear interaction of light and matter, uh, nonlinear interaction that in fact uh, um, follows um, the so-called parametric frequency conversion, where it generates signal idler pairs. And it's a very, very similar type of interaction that's also studied in um, JAWS and bifurcation amplifiers, where um, you have a so-called kernel linearity. So kernel linearity is a intensity-dependent resonant frequency shift. Um, and, um, and in the case of the optical resonators, this is mediated by the so-called kernel linearity, by intensity-dependent refractive index. When you pump a cavity strongly enough, the system will give rise to new states of light. And, um, and, um, and what kind of typical power levels do you need to generate these new states of light? Well, um, and the power level that's, that, that you need is simply the power to exceed okay, the cavity line width. Um, and, um, and so the, the so-called, it's a bifurcation criteria. And so it's pretty experts. And, um, and this is actually very similar, interestingly, to also work in um, superconducting circuits where you also use the same physics, okay, but now not using a Chi-3, but a Chi-2 nonlinearity. Um, but uh, also here you exploit the fact that the cavity becomes bistable and supports uh, and generates new states of light. And uh, in our research, um, I'll be very brief here, we can generate new states of light, and in our case there's different ways, but what's most interesting, we generate so-called solitons, so-called optical combs, and uh, we can even do so in, in very complex optical microresonators um, um, and, um, and generate completely chip scale optical frequency cones that could have uses um, in, uh, in frequency metrology, in particular for optical atomic clocks, but also for classical applications like AD, photonic ADC, radar, frequency synthesizer, coherent communications. And we have explored many actually of these applications. Um, but it shows that these optical microresonators are also test beds and, and can be harnessed for, for optical frequency metrology. And I'll leave you um, this here as a last slide. Um, this is actually is a collaboration with a group of John Bowers and Kerry Vahala, where we showed uh, perhaps some of the most dramatic example um, of, uh, of, uh, of, of microcombs. This is a fully integrated uh, optical synthesizer a fully integrated optical chip scale combs. It uses our uh, 15, our silicon nitride integrated resonators together with uh, lasers to create a completely chip scale optical comb um, that can be used um, for microwave generation or to um, uh, to lock to atomic transitions um, and serve uh, in, a, in an optical clockwork. With this, I'd like to really thank um, um, for the invitation here to ETH and uh, thank the, the organizers um, for their for their attention. Thank you.